Okay. Okay, um, welcome everybody to lecture 10 of CSE 548, the uh, analysis of algorithms. Um, let me start off, first of all, are there any questions about um, anything about the homeworks or an exam which happens to be coming up next class? Um, is there any interest about that? Okay, the midterm will be next class, okay, it'll be in here, okay? Again, it's open book, okay, open modest amount of notes, okay, so don't bring in a library. Um, the, um, there's a copy of my midterm from um, the last time I taught the course, now is available from the web pages. All my lecture notes for the semester are now available from the web pages. Copies of the midterm and the solutions to the homeworks are also available in the library. Okay, actually, I'm not sure about the second homework yet, but uh, I'll hopefully get that there sometime soon. Um, so those resources are available. Some people have asked if they want to see a, they want to see a certain lecture again. Okay, how can they do it? Okay, the tapes are available in Javits. The, the Javits it's the room next to Javits 108. So you can go and you say, hey, I want to watch lecture one or lecture two. They've got video screening stations there, so you can watch it um, there. And um, if you want to have a whole day of just watching the whole semester's worth of lectures, that'll probably take, you know, take about a 12-hour day. I don't know if that's the best use of your 12 hours of study time, but uh, you're, welcome. You're, welcome to, right, you're welcome to do that. I don't know if people have 12 hours to do that. Any questions about the exam or the mechanics of everything? Okay. Yes, question. Um, I'd rather you don't bring other books, okay? Just because um, if you have some book that for some religious reason you want to bring, you show it to me and we'll, we'll discuss it. But I'd rather people not, it, it's pointless for people to come in with libraries. This is also to save you some arm strain, okay? I mean, you know, it's, it, I'm not going to ask you a book, a question that you're supposed to be able to look up in a book, okay? The questions I ask are going to be questions basically where, um, assuming that you know the general principles of what we've done so far, Okay, what have we discussed? We've talked, discussed some of the mathematical notation that we use for analyzing algorithms, the big O notation. We've discussed how you solve recurrence relations. Okay, we've discussed different techniques for sorting. Okay, we've discussed different techniques for data structures. Okay, and that's basically um, the kind of stuff we've come up with so far. That's the kind of stuff I'll put on the test. Okay, and uh, the test will be curved. I don't expect everybody to get, I don't expect everybody to get a perfect score by any means, okay? Yes, question. Covers everything up till the end of what I mentioned today, okay? Fair enough, any questions? Okay, question, yes. In principle, my, my, my goal is the questions should be similar to not incredibly hard homework problems. That's sort of what I'm thinking. Whether that's what I achieve is another question, but that's at least what I'm thinking about. And to see sort of what I consider as fair questions or reasonable questions, you can take a look at the exam that I had on the web page. And I think those are analogous to those kind of problems. Any other questions? Okay, let's go on. Um, there were two problems of the day. I'd like to talk about one of them first and then the other one a little bit later. The first one asked, okay, how do you describe, describe a red-black tree largest and smallest ratio of red nodes, okay? So basically, we want to look at red-black trees and try to figure out which, of the, which ones have a lot of red nodes, which ones don't, okay? And it should be clear that we could, can build a red-black tree without any red nodes, okay? That, that, that it's because there's no law against stacking um, consecutive blacks. So long as we pack all of our leaves at the same level and fill everything in between with Nodes. Every node is going to have the same black height, okay? Th there's, no, there's no problems with adjacent reds. There's no problems with anything. So in the worst case, the ratio, okay, to minimize the number of, it's not really worst case, best case, it's more a question just to make sure we understand what a tree looks like. We can get rid of all the red, black, all the black nodes and achieve a ratio of one, okay? The other question says, sort of, what's the maximum number of red nodes in the tree? Okay, and this is something that, um, you know, if we think about it, if we sort of think about it, we can't have two red nodes on the same next to each other because that violates our conditions. So we have to separate them. We still would like to pack as many nodes as possible 
as many red nodes as possible in there. Okay. What is sort of going to be what is going to be the, um, the 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 case that we? You may say, well, if we want to alternate red and black nodes, okay, does it pay for us to start with a red node or start with a black node as, as a root of our tree? Okay, if we want to pack the what? The root has to be black. Is that one of the conditions, legal conditions? Okay, it depends what you mean. It's not really an important point that I want to make here. Okay, but I mean basically I follow the definition. Root is colored root or black. The leaf pointers are black. The um, the uh, node is red. Both the children are black, and everyone contains the rest one. So by my legal definition of a red black tree, I don't need it. In my algorithm, I'm going to do it. Okay, but that's just to make a special kind of red black tree. But what the interesting point here is that if I want to make alternating red and black nodes, okay, it isn't so important whether I start with a red or a black level. If I want as many red nodes as I want, it's the property that I need. Okay? If I want to get as many red nodes as possible in there, I want the last level, okay, to be red. Okay? So to a certain extent, it depends upon whether I'm going to have an even or odd number of levels. Because if you take a look at it in a binary tree, the last level, the leaves, is twice as many leaves as there are in the previous level. And in fact, there are as many leaves in, okay, in a full binary tree as there are all the nodes in all the Okay? So it should be clear that that's sort of the kind of thing that I want to have. Okay? It's make sure that my bottom level is, is red, my bottom le level of real nodes. Okay, my, I'll have to have pointers at the bottom, but, but I want bottom levels there. Okay, so then what is, what is the number of red nodes that I'm going to get in that case? How would I figure out what that ratio is? Okay, the way that I would have figured it out is, well, taking a look at a tree like this, okay, fraction of nodes that I get, okay, if I want to maximize the red nodes, the lower level is going to contain half the nodes. Okay, the next lowest level will contain a fourth of the nodes. The one before that will contain an eighth of the nodes. Right, because each lot level we go up, we have the number of nodes, because it's a binary trait. So if I want to maximize the reds, I would get one half plus one eighth plus one thirty second dot. If I add up just those three numbers, I get close to two thirds. The black nodes would be one fourth plus 1 16th plus 1 64th, the levels I didn't pick up and assigned to red, which if I add that up comes out to be very close to a third. Again, I'm not truncating. I'm, I'm, only, I'm just adding up uh, these small fractions. It should be clear this fraction is converging. Okay? What is the series that I would end up Basically, it's going to be a each time I'm taking the previous value, I'm taking one-fourth of the previous nodes. So basically, it's going to be something like summing up n to the fourth, n to the sixth, you know, it's what, what's, n over four to the i. Okay? That's the number of black nodes. So I can sum that thing up and subtract it from n, because if I want to figure out how many red nodes there are, there's the number of total nodes this is a simple series to sum up. This comes up to, be two, to, to become one-third, okay? So I end up with um, two-thirds n. It's sort of provably the ratio that I get. Any questions about what I was doing there? Okay? Ah, sorry about that. Okay, so the summation here is going basically up to whatever, however much I want it to. It's a geometric series, so I don't care how big I make it. Might as well go to infinity. Okay? And that each time I'm taking one fourth as many nodes as the previous level, and that's what happens. Any questions about that? Okay? Fair enough. Now, last time what we spent a lot of time talking about was how do you um, define what a red black tree is? Okay? And we proved that red black trees have a logarithmic height. Okay? If you have n nodes that are any red black indeed a red black tree, okay, it's going to have um, logarithmic height. That we proved, that's the last we need to talk about logarithms. Question? 
There was an Alhambra question. I'm going to slide it to, in a, in a, I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, I'm sort of finessing it because I didn't talk about rotations until now. Okay. Um, so, so, so what happened? Okay. We proved that every single um, red-black tree had logarithmic height. We had a red-black tree is. We showed that if we had a very, we couldn't get a very skewed red-black tree. What we need now is, in order to, to, to get a, a, a search tree that will give us logarithmic height, we need to be able to show that we can take our tree, if it was a red-black tree, add something to it, and reshape it so it stays to be a red-black tree. So the bottom line is we need some way to reshape trees. Okay? And the basic operation we have to restructure trees are let's get close up here. What is a rotation? Well, this may be a little bit confusing because the letters may be a little small. But basically what a rotation is, is if we have two nodes in a tray, okay, x below y, what a rotation is is a search tree operation that restructures it by lifting the node x to the root and dropping the other node down. Okay, that's the, the, the intuition behind a red-black tree. So suppose this was a value of a, this had a value of b, this had a value of c. If we think about it, the leaves are in the order that they're going to be in the pre, in, in, in regular binary search order. If I lift node x above y, what do I know? Okay, x is now the root. Everything to the left, so this is the node x. This is the node x. If I lift x to the root, everything that was less to be to the left of it, correct? What was everything in this tree that was less than x? Okay, it couldn't have been b because b was greater than x. Couldn't have been y because y was greater than x. Basically, the subtree a. To this node here, we've got to have, down here, everything that was greater than x and greater than y. Since x was less than y, c. So we put c here. And here, what we have in b is everything that was less than x but greater than y. No, um, no, excuse me, uh, less than y but greater than x, excuse me. So what do we know? What is greater than x and less than y? B. Basically what I did is I lifted one node up, dropped one node down, and the children. Okay? But I did the reshuffling so that if it was a binary search tree before, that binary search tree ordering is still respected. That's what the beauty of these rotations are. Okay, they're not, abs you know, they, they look kind of complicated at first. But once you study them enough, they're absolutely inevitable. Okay, because you want to do a local change to a tray. You want to do a local change to a tray that involves very few points. Okay, so if we do this, all we've done is reshuffle a couple of pointers. Okay, if we reshuffle three pointers, it can be done in constant time to do any rotation. That's the first observation. The second observation is that any search tree, if it was a search tree before, it's going to stay a search tree. If we just did a, re a rearrangement operation by taking random branches of our tree and scrambling them, but the rotation preserves the search tree ordering. That's the important thing about it. Okay. Finally, what good does it do to restructure it? If we think about what's happening, taking a look at this example again, one subtree, B, stays the same height as it was before. Okay? One subtree, A, moves closer to the root, and one subtree moves further than the root. So this provides us a way to rebalance a tree if we know where the imbalances are occurring. If we know that A is getting to be too big, the height of the subtree rooted in A is getting long relative to the subtree rooted in C, by doing a rotation, we can, we can readjust the balance there, okay? And put somebody with a lot more stuff a little bit closer to the root, okay? 
So these rotations do exactly what we would want them to do. Okay? In terms of restructuring the trees. Okay? And the goal is going to be to try to figure out how do we apply these rotations in a way that's going to help us out. Okay? Any questions about rotations and why they exist? Okay? These things look mysterious the first time you see them. Okay? But they actually make sense. And I want that to be clear. That there's a reason why we, why we, why we care about them. They're not magical. Okay? Any questions? So what happens? Again, when you understand them on this level, okay, you should see that just as you, here we move the left node up and drop the right one down. It's also possible to do the rotation the other way. We call that a right rotation, where we take the right node, move that up, and drop the child down. Okay? And these are inverse operations from each other. Okay? What happened? Here we had A, here we had B, here we had C. If we move Y up, what do we want as the leftmost child? Well, Y is going to be greater than X. So everything that's less than Y, less than X, it's got to be A. Everything that's going to be greater than Y has to, by definition, be greater than X. So C goes there, and B slides in the other slot. OK, we can do rotations either left or right, same basic operation. Any questions about that? OK, once you understand them on that conceptual level, again, they're tricky programming. If you actually had to sit down and write a program to do it, it's a little bit tricky to implement point, to, to do the pointer manipulations, but not really hard. This is the code, all the code it takes to do a rotation. OK, you're just moving three pointers around in a specific condition. I don't really want to go through with that, OK? But the point is that, 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 that it's a logical operation that preserves the search order. And it only does a constant amount of stuff. You'll see there's no loops, no Any questions? OK. The other thing to realize when we talk about these rotations is that these rotations do not actually necessarily have to happen at the leaf nodes. Rotations can happen anywhere in a tray. OK? What a rotation says is we take any pair of nodes and we're changing the relative position of those nodes. Okay? So here we have an example of a rotation that's happening in the middle of the tray. Okay? And if you think about it, the, the neat thing about the rotations are, even though this is happening in the middle of the tray, again, here's an 11, here's an 18, if we rotate it, what's going to happen? That means we want to put 18 up, 11 down. We're then going to want to move around this subtree, this subtree, this subtree. The interesting thing to see here is when we do a rotation, we're moving whole subtrees around. Notice that this subtree um, 14, this, this subtree here 14, 12, 16, that got moved around to another place in the tree. It's got a different parent. Even though we're moving subtrees around, Notice that it still takes constant time no matter how big these subtrees are. Because all we're actually doing is changing the parent pointers. The subtrees themselves are okay? So we can do really large scale manipulations of the tray by only diddling a couple of pointers. Okay, and that's gotta be clear. Okay, any questions about rotations? Why we care about them, how powerful they are. Okay? Good. Now let's go to the other problem of the day, which again, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to cover rotations a little earlier. But now that we understand rotations, the question is, show that any n node tree can be transformed to any other n node tree using only a linear number of rotations. OK? So the claim is that a rotation is a tree structuring operation. OK? And that if we apply these rotations in the right place, we can turn anything into anything. OK? And the claim here is that only a linear number of rotations is suffice. Now, when I was first given this problem, I thought this was actually kind of a hard problem. How many people thought this was an easy problem when they looked at it? How many people thought it was a hard problem? Uh, more people. OK? How did I work on this problem? Let's sort of use this as, as a case study for how I solve problems. Maybe it'll help you in some other ways. The first thing was, when I looked at this thing, I saw I want to change any rotation tree to any other tree. How do I do it? 
Well, they said linear rotations. I couldn't figure that out at first. So what I start off by doing is come up with a simple but correct algorithm. This is, I think, the first of the problem. If you can't do it in linear time, can you do it at all? Can you show that any tree can be transformed to any other tree? Okay? And for this, the answer is yes, I could. Okay? First thing I did is I showed that n squared rotations would be enough to convert any tree to any other tree. Why n squared? Well, let's think about it. The hint that they gave us, okay, was convert the thing to a right going chain. Now, hint, okay? Notice that in taking any tree, if I gave an algorithm that could convert any tree to a right going chain, since left and right rotations are reverse operations, if I took all the steps that took my tree and took it to, to T1 and took it to a, rotated, a, a left chain, and then took T2 and converted it to a left chain, by reversing left and right on the second tree, I could go back to the original. I, that would mean I could go from the, right, the, from the chain back to the tree. So the first claim is that if I could convert every tree into a right going chain, that would be enough. If I gave an algorithm to do that, that would be enough to convert every tree to um, any other tree by doing at most twice that many comparison ro rotations. OK? How many people believe that? How many people? OK? A few people don't believe that. Now, why is it? OK? Suppose, let's say, I have this tree. And I give you an algorithm to convert this tree to um, a twig. Because left and right rotations are reverses of each other, suppose I did this by saying do a left rotation, a right rotation, a right rotation, a left rotation, left, right, left. OK? To that, how would I go about doing that? OK? What I do is go down to the last thing I did. If it took me a left rotation at some point to get me here, if I now did this right rotation, that would get me back to the state that I was before that. Correct? Because there's an inverse operation. This goes one way. If I know how to walk to you, OK? If I know, I know how to walk back to where I started. OK? Wherever I did a, a, a step forward, I now do a step back. That's the exact same principle here. OK? So if I knew how to go back there, I'll simply reverse my steps. OK? When the last thing was a left, I'll do a right, right, so on. Uh, left, left, right. So my claim is that, I, that if I show how I can, I'm done. Any questions about that? OK? So the first idea is, how can I convert every tree to a chain correctly? OK? And my first idea was, OK, I want to make it a chain. If I'm going to make a right going tree as my chain, what is the root value of my tree going to be? OK? Quite, Binary search trees, if it's got no left descendant, it's got to be the smallest one. OK? So how many steps, ro rotations will it take to move the smallest guy up to the root? If I've got the smallest guy sitting here, what happens if I do a rotation? How would I get this guy closer to the root? I do a rotation where I move this guy up and this guy down. Correct? That moves it one step closer to the root. And now I've got this guy sitting here. I want him to go to the root. I do another rotation to move him one step closer. By doing one rotation at a time, I can always move it one step closer to the root. So what's the biggest number of rotations it will take in any tree to get the smallest element up to the root? N, the height of the tree. OK, I haven't promised you this was a, a balanced tray. The question said, for any red node tray. So maybe you gave me as input a left going twig. OK, 
and you want to move this guy to the root. How do you move this guy to the root? One step at a time. Move it up, move it up, move it up, move it up. Okay? It might take n rotations to move it to the top. But once it's at the top, what is how would, what would the second node in the Okay? Its successor. Where is its successor going to be? On the left or right of this node? Right, because I put it there. This is now the root. So now I just have to rotate the second highest one up. Okay? And what's the maximum note rotations that might take? Proportional to the height of the tree, which might be n for all I know if I'm unlucky. So by moving each one of the nodes up to the point where it belongs, okay, that would take at most n rotations. That would give me an algorithm that will guarantee to work in n squared rotations. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Come up with the correct but slow algorithm first, and now I understand my problem better. Okay? Question. OK, so the question is, is there some way that maybe I could short circuit the process by instead just yanking this node out and putting it someplace else and stitching things up? OK? In general, the answer is, 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 is I might have to move a lot of things in my tray. Maybe it's a special case for the lowest element. OK? But the basic problem asks to do it using rotations and not using sort of a hacksaw or anything else that might restructure it. OK? So, so want to do it. Any other questions? OK? So how could I reduce this now from an n squared problem to my next step was to try to reduce it to an n log n problem? How could I get away using n log n rotations? OK? And my idea was, instead of converting it to a twig, why don't I instead try to convert every tree to a perfectly balanced tree? Right. What was the idea here? Well, if, first of all, it's the same kind of idea. If I could convert every tree to a perfectly balanced tree, then by my same reversal argument, I could go back from the reversed balanced tree. Okay, it suffers the same property as the twig. But how do I create a balanced tree? What I'm going to do now is, what is the root node in a perfectly balanced tree going to be? Okay. The median is in a perfectly balanced tree, I have the same number of guys on the left as the same number of guys on the right. So how many steps will it take to percolate the median node up to its position? Well, it depends upon what the tree is, but, but depending upon whatever the height of that node is. If I was very unlucky, I mean, conceivably, the median might be at the very bottom. It might be order, you know, order n rotations. Okay. So after doing n rotations, I could get my median to the top. And once I've got it to the top, now I've got a situation that's just like quicksort. OK? Why is that? Because in each case, I want to try to find what's the median element, take the median element and move it up. OK? The time that the number of rotations I'm going to need is, if I want to find all the rotations of if I have n nodes to start with, moving the, the median up to the top will take order n time. Once I've got the median at the time, if I want to end up with a perfectly balanced tree, what is my subproblems now? On the left, I have how many nodes? n over 2. On the right, I have n over 2. So in fact, the number of rotations I would need to do this recursively would follow this recurrence relation, which is exactly what we did basically you know, for, for quicksort or merge sort or any of these other ones, which is n log n. OK? So any questions about my n log? How many people see my n log n solution? How many people don't see it and want to discuss it? OK, any questions? OK, or just confusion? OK? The basic idea is that now I've done a divide and conquer 
by moving the median element up. I've split my problem into two equal halves. And that's exactly what I wanted quicksort to do. Do potentially n rotations or n things to split the problem in half. Okay, and that's where the n log n comes from. Question. Oh, notice what this is saying. Does this say how, how much time you're spending? Is the problem asking for how much time you're spending doing the computations? Oh, it's only all n rotations. It says how many rotations do you need? Okay. okay. It doesn't say anything about how, how, how much time it takes to plan the rotations. Okay. Any questions? Okay. That's what I thought about it. And then I started thinking, well, wait. Now, the book's really asking for a linear algorithm. Now, what was I worried about? Okay, I was worried about if I was going to do an insertion algorithm, if I ended up with a tree like this, if in fact I was going to go move all my elements up to the top, okay, it could take n rotations to move this guy into the next position, and then n positions, or you know, order n. So if I was really going to do this in linear time, I have to be careful to make sure that I'm not moving things spending a lot of time moving things that are not ultimately ending up in the right position. Now, it turns out that there's a fairly simple and slick algorithm to do this in n rotations to get to a rightmost chain. What was the idea? The idea was that we're going to do an algorithm. We're going to always find the lowest rightmost element. OK? The lowest um, element. Okay, on the right chain, which has a left ancestor. Why do we do that? What happens if we take this node and we do a rotation? The node on the left ancestor, do a rotation. This node, let's just go up again. If we do a rotation on this guy, what happens? Does y go up or down? y goes up. Where does z go? Where does these rightmost children go? Down. So if I do this rotation afterwards, y is the parent, zz is the child, and zz's children is here. If I always do a rotation on the lowest leftmost descendant, I claim what I've done is increased the length of the right spine by 1. Notice that what I did is I took this node y and threw him into the right chain. OK? Now, if I could do that with every single rotation, throw one guy into the right chain, what's the maximum number of elements that I can put in the right chain? n. OK? So by doing n rotations, each of which throws one guy into the right chain, OK, I will end up with n nodes in the right chain which means that they're right, OK? And n rotations suffice. OK, any questions? OK, so here's the situation. I've got a no, I've got, I'm going to take a look at my tray, find where is the lowest child in the tray who has a left descendant. That means that there is a node here. By doing the rotation of lifting this guy up and moving that guy down, what happens? I throw another element, namely y, into the right chain. OK? And so the slickness here is that because I'm throwing one element into the right chain each time, after n throws, I've thrown all of them in there. OK? Any questions about that? This was slick. This took me a while to figure out. OK? Question. So one option is you start with the root. So you're saying instead of going from the bottom up, you mean go from the top down? Yeah. That, I think, will also work. The important more invariant is you're constantly throwing one guy in. So long as every time you're throw, increasing the size of the right, the, the, the right nodes by one, that shouldn't be a problem. OK? Uh, I, yeah, OK. It, it's, um, let me just think about it. Suppose we did this thing. Um, I, just, uh, I, I think that will work. I think that will work, too. The important point is you have to prove that each time you're erasing one of the, uh, throwing one guy into the right chain, I think that will work. OK, question. Why are you trying to build uh, the right chain? 
Well, because that's what it sort of was. The, the idea was that we wanted to convert each tree. Okay, why do we think about the right chain? The idea was that we wanted to convert every tree into one particular tree. Because then we could, if we showed how to convert every tree into one canonical tree, we could reverse the process to get back to any other tree. It was sort of like if I show everybody how to get to Penn Station in the world, okay? I can show everybody how to get, tell everybody how to get to um, every place in the world. Because if they go to Penn Station, they can just reverse the steps to go back to any place else. Okay? So that's sort of the same idea. The right spine is suffering, the, the idea of the rightmost twig is suffering the role of Penn Station. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? For the solution, couldn't you also just do a depth first traversal and on the way back, um, whenever you have a left trough with the right rotation? The, 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 the invariant that you have to show, the question is, here's another idea based on doing it. My suspicion is so long as you can show that you're always increasing the size of the right spine, okay, by, by one, that, that argument holds. If not, you've got to give me another reason to show that you're not going to actually be doing, having to do extra work. That you're, that you're always going to be doing something that you're never going to undo. So you hit every note only once. So if some of the time you do a rotation, other times you do, you do not. Okay. It's probably, a, it, it, you might be right, I don't know. Okay, it's something that's a little subtle and I don't want to think about it now. Okay, but, it, but, but, but that might be, there, there's undoubtedly other ways to do it. This is the way I thought about doing it. Okay? Any questions? Again, it, this is kind of complicated. The important thing is to see the mechanics that we can take any tree and convert it to anything else doing rotations. Okay, and the key idea is we have to, to make use of rotations, we have to know where to apply them. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Well, the reason why this is going to come up is we'd like to now show how we insert things into a red-black tree. What is the point? Okay, We know red-black trees have to have log n height. We know that if we can, ins if we just want to, if we can take a red-black tree, show how to insert a node and delete a node, and keep it a red-black tree, Okay, we have a perfectly efficient data structure, a log, a, a log on all operations. Okay, question. How, do you, how does that answer the question? Which question? Oh, you back to the other question. Okay, let's go back for a second. The question here was, okay, show that any node can be transformed to any other node, any tree can be translated to any other tree using order n rotations. Okay, so. So I showed that any tree could be transformed into a twig using how many rotations? Okay. If any tree can be transformed to a, 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 um, a twig, that means that I take my original tree, T1, convert it to a twig. I then take my tree, T2, convert it to a twig. Then reverse all these operations. And now if you want to go from T1 to T2, we go through Penn Station, okay, and then walk back. That's the idea here, okay? In some sense, we later on in the semester, we're going to talk about reducing problems, okay? And the basic idea is we take our big problem, and we show that if we can solve a simpler problem, it's really solving the same thing. So what we proved here is that converting any tree to any other tree is the same as converting any tree to a rightmost chain, since all you have to do is double the work and you're done. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? But what was the key point here? Or what was the, the, the reason why we cared about rotations? The main reason was that we wanted to be able to insert things into red-black trees, keeping the guaranteed log n time. Meaning we want to be able to insert somebody into a red-black tree and make sure that it stays a red-black tree. Okay? So how would we have normally inserted things into a binary search tree? Okay, if you remember the algorithm from last time, we started it, we did basically follow the pointers left, right, left, right, till we got to the nil pointer where that item belonged, and we stuck it right in there. Okay, that was regular insertion. Okay? Suppose we try to do the same thing with a binary search tree, that same insertion algorithm, and work on a red-black tree. Okay? 
Namely, if we want to insert this item, we say, well, it's, oh, it's, it's uh, less than the root, it's greater than this guy, less than this guy, oops, here's the nil pointer, let's stick it in. That will insert it into the binary search tree. If we want to guarantee we've still got balance, we've got to make it a red-black tree. Okay? Now, our first idea here is going to be, maybe we can keep it a red-black tree, but we the color of some nodes. Okay? So let's think about it. What happens if we take this thing, it was a beautiful red-black tree, notice the height, the black height is one, 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 beautiful red-black tree before. Insert a new node in here. What color can we make this node in order to keep it a red-black tree? Okay, if we color this thing red, is that going to solve the problem? Parent. We're not allowed to have a red parent. We've got to follow the definition of a red-black tree, which, just to remind you again, was that every node is red or black, every leaf is black, or the nil pointers are black. If a node is red, both its children are black, and any path has the same red and black has the same black height to the to, to a leaf. So what's the point? If we insert this guy, parent was black. Okay, we could make this node red without any problems. Why is that? Because if this node was black, if its parent was black, making this guy red is not going to violate the, the, the t red parent's child problem. And it's also not going to change the black height of anybody. Okay? What happens if, given this tree, I just made this node black? Is that going to be legal? Why not? This, node, this leaf pointer was perfectly happy being the same black height as this guy. If now you insert another black node here, its children are now going to be one level of blackness greater to have one more black height than that one. So if the parent was red, we have no choice. We can't make the node red. We can't make the node black and keep it a red-black tray. OK? How many people agree with that? How many, good. How many people do not agree with that? OK, everybody agrees. OK? So what happens? OK, if this node, we inserted it, the parent was black, we can make it red, everybody's happy. But what happens if? We have two red nodes in a row. How do we fix it up? That's really the question. Turns out the way that we're going to fix it is going to depend upon our uncle. What's our uncle? Remember, the uncle is our father's or parent, or a father's brother is an uncle in real life, okay, or in typical family trees. So what's our situation? Here we have a node we inserted. We couldn't make it black without changing the black height. If we make it red, everybody's happy as far as black height goes. The trouble is we've got this local problem, that we're the same color as our parent. OK? How can we fix the problem up? Well, it's going to depend upon our uncle. OK? Question. Exactly right, OK? Why did we define all these nil pointers? We went through this rigmarole of saying nil pointers were black. Why did we do that? Well, one of the reasons we did that was to guarantee that we're going to have an uncle. OK? Because if the, we have a grandparent, that grandparent's going to have to have two children, even if one of those children is only a nil. OK? So that's why we defined it that way. It makes it a little slicker. Yeah, question. There isn't a grandparent. OK, that means that this guy's the root. OK? If it's the root node, suppose we have a tree. Uh, actually, I'll probably go through that case a little later, but since we're interested in that, suppose we have a root node, red. What would happen if we changed that node to black? OK? If this was red, who cares what one of its parent descendants might be red? By changing it to black, the black height to all other nodes is going to increase by 1. 
which means that the black height to all other nodes is going to stay the same. So if we have, don't have a grandparent, then we're simply going to color ourselves differently. And the problem's going to go away. OK, do you believe that? Or if not, OK, we'll, maybe we'll talk about it a little later. But, but the basic idea is that if we don't have a grandparent, we're going to solve the problem by recoloring. OK? Any questions? OK? But what's the situation? Here we are. This is a node we want to insert. This is our parent who was there before. What color is our grandparent? OK? If, this no, if, if we had just inserted this node and red was our parent, what color did our grandparent have to be? Black. Why did it have to be black? Right, because red was red. Because the, the, our, our, this guy was red. The only way it could have been red is if its parent was black. So we knew grandpa had to be black. Black node can have any colored children. Red nodes, on the other hand, can only have black children. That's the definition. Okay, that's the laws we're living under. Okay. So what do we know? We know this guy's got red. Is, is he's a troublemaker? This guy was red. I mean, basically, the parent. The fact that the parent was red is also causing trouble. But grandpa has to be black. Our uncle. What color can our uncle be? Maybe red. Maybe black. Suppose the uncle was red. How could we solve the problem? OK? If this guy's red and this guy's red and this guy's black, what we could do is recolor the two red nodes, the parent and the uncle, color them black, and color the grandpa red. What does that mean? What is that going to do? OK? If now these guys become black and this becomes red, this guy now has a black parent. So it's perfectly happy. Has the black height of any of its children changed? No. Because in the course of going through the grandparent, instead of going black-red, I'm now going red-black. So by doing this recoloring process, this node is now happy. The black heights are now happy. Is anybody potentially unhappy? The great-grandparent might not be happy. Because this guy, the grandparent was black. What color was great-grandpa? Could have been red, or it could have been black. It had a black child, so we don't know anything about what color great-grandpa was. So what has happened when we've done this recoloring? Okay, Everybody's happy except possibly the great-grandfather. But now all we, what we've done is taken our problem and pushed our problem upstairs one time. In constant time, we've either solved our problem or pushed the problem upstairs. If we have a red-black tree, how many times can we push it upstairs before we hit the root? Log in. OK? So doing a constant amount of pushing the trouble away per times log n times is still order log n. So eventually, we're either going to come up with a um, properly black ancestor, or we push the problem to the root. OK? So this problem can be taken care of just by recoloring. OK? Any questions about that? So the case of the red uncle is easy, relatively easy to solve. Yeah. yeah. What, if an uncle is black? what if an uncle is black? Okay. Okay. Then we get the case of the black uncle. Okay. What is the situation now? Here is the node we're inserting. Here is the old parent. Okay which we said was red. That's what's causing our trouble in the first place. Grandpa was black for the same reason grandpa had to be black before. What do we know about our uncle? Well, we've got the case of the black uncle, so the uncle is black. OK? What do we know about our other nodes? OK? Well, the red guy 
its other child, this is the node we inserted, he's a troublemaker. The other guy has to have had a black child. Because if this was there, this was there before, if it was a red black tree, this guy had to have a black child. Okay, so this guy is black. The children we have, since we've left things calm beneath us, have to be black. So we live in a tree where our two red troublemakers are completely surrounded by black nodes. Okay? How many people believe that? Okay, how many people do not believe that? Or want an explanation as to, is there anybody, any relative who you're suspicious of? Okay, who you don't feel you know what color they are. Okay? It has to be the case that we get this situation. So how are we going to solve this problem? Okay? We're going to solve this problem by doing a rotation around what we, the B node. Which is the B node? The B node is our grandparent. Okay? What is a rotation going to do if we do this restructuring? Okay? B is going to go down, A is going to go up. Correct? That's the rotation that we're going to end up with. So if we do that, we've got a tree that looks like this. B has gone down, A has gone up. Okay? The children of it, well, we know that this subtree is going to get stuck as the left subtree of the low side. This subtree, the uncle, is greater than everybody. Our uncle is going to be sitting here. Okay? And the other guy here is going to fill in the middle pointer. So what do we now know after we've done the rotation? This node here is here, black, black, red. We'll leave everybody the way they are. Okay? The uncle was black and the other guy. We'll leave them down here as black. How can we now recolor these two nodes in order to make sure that everybody's happy? Okay? Could we color both of these nodes? Could we color this node here red? Why not? It's got a red this child. So what happens if instead we take this node and color it black? Okay? What color can we make this child? If we may think about it, let's think about we need to make the colors so that we preserve the black heights, correct? That's the problem we need to make sure we take care of. The black uncle has to pass through one black node to make it happy. Okay? This is the black uncle over here. So to keep the black uncle happy, this guy's got to be red. Okay? To keep B happy, B had, okay, one black node. Basically, B was black and they had no black ancestors in our set. Sure enough, B is now, has one black ancestor. So the black height of B is everything that it was before. Okay, so the uncle's happy, the B's happy, A is now black, okay? Before, A had one black ancestor and was itself red. So there was one thing of blackness up to it. Now there is still one thing of blackness up to it. Taking this node here, okay, the red node, okay, X, X had one unit of blackness ahead of it. Now where is X? X still has one unit of blackness ahead of it. And its two children have that one unit plus themselves as being black. So everybody's black height is now the same as it was before. Okay, that's the kind of delicate thing that we've done. Done one rotation, and our problem is solved. And recoloring. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. The mechanics of it require going through it a little bit slowly. Okay, so if you didn't pick it up the first time, I urge you to go through the slides and see the, why it's inevitable. Okay, but by recoloring, we fix up the local problem. Is there any global problem that can result from what we've done? If we tad the
when we did this? Do the problems stop or do they keep going any further? How does our grandfather feel about these changes? Grandpa's very happy. Why? It had a black child before. It still has a black child. Okay? Everything below it has had, is colored the same way. So you're not causing any two red problems. You're not causing any black height problems because everything below us doesn't recognize that anything's happened. Anything above us doesn't recognize that anything's happened. And the guys that are actually involved in this situation are all content. So if it was a red black tree, in the case of the black uncle, the one rotation kills it. Okay, and the problem's gone away. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, it's kind of a slick thing. These these trees, you know, balanced tree operations, I think, are just very, very beautiful. Okay, this is this involves a lot of cleverness to have worked these kind of things out. Okay, that's actually the way you should respect this thing from a cleverness point of view. Okay, and see how because we had these colors associated with the nodes. We could work out exactly what we had to do in order to patch things up. So what's an example? Let's just go through another example to make sure people sort of get this. Here we've got a situation where we've got two red nodes. X is the guy we inserted. Okay. We've got a black, um, what do you call it? A black parent, a red parent. What's the problem? Well, this is the problem. So how do we solve the problem? Well, we look at our uncle. Our uncle is red. What was the solution to solve the problem when we had a red parent and a red uncle? By recovering to black. What has changed? Okay. To go from here to here, bop, 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 I pass through one black node to get the four. From here to here, bop, 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 I pass through one black node to get the four. To get down to here, I pass through one node, black node. Here I pass through one black node. So if I had a red uncle, all I did was recolor it. And that pushed the problem upstairs. OK? Is everybody Question? Did you say we inserted two? We inserted, um, no, we inserted x, which is 4. Why is 2 there? Am I missing something? Why is 2 there? 2 is there in the tree, because it's, it's there. Well, this, this was a red-black tree. Let's start it off. This was a red-black tree. Why? Because to every leaf, we have to go through two black nodes, right? Black, two black, two black, two black. <coughs> this was a red-black tree, and suddenly we insert four. Where do we insert it at the leaf? Once we insert it there, we, try to we can't color it black, because that's going to change the black height of its nil pointers. So let's color it red and patch up the troubles, OK? The first trouble, we have the red uncle. We patch that up by coloring it, by, by changing the colors of our grandparent and our parent and uncle. That pushed the problem upstairs. Did we get rid of the problem? OK. No. Now we've got a red parent and a black uncle. So to kill this problem, we've got to take care of rotations. OK. Now, this particular example, is slightly different than the example I showed you before. Why is that? In the example I showed you before, the new node was the left child of the, the parent, correct? Here, the node is the right child. The, the, the new node is the right child of the parent. So it's not quite the same case as we had before. How can we get it from this case to the other case? What we really want to do is to lift this guy up and drop that guy down. How do you do it? With a rotation, a rotate left. By taking these nodes and doing one rotation and leaving color, everybody else is happy. Why is that? Color-wise, everybody's happy. Why? Because for all of these subtrees, there was that subtree 8. He had go through, he went through two reds. Now he goes through one red. 
Does that bother him as far as black height goes? No, because the red nodes have no impact in the black height. So in the course of doing this one rotation, two nodes that got shuffled were both red. They, um, what do you call it? All that happened is the black heights don't change for them. So by doing one rotation, we get to the case that we actually knew how to solve before. We showed how to solve by doing a rotation and recoloring. Okay? And so by doing one second rotation now, red, red, black, with a left child, now we do the rotation and the recoloring, and everybody is happy. Okay? Any questions about this procedure? Okay? It's good to go through it and convince yourself that this actually works and is right. Okay? Because it's quite, quite, quite an impressive little accomplishment here. Okay? To do these kind of things. Any questions? Okay? Um, again, these things are not that horrible to implement. Again, it's tricky, but it's not ugly. Okay? There's a difference. Okay? This is sort of all the code that you need. I don't want to, I want you to see it sort of faded because I don't want you to look through it too carefully. Okay? But basically, this is all the code that you need in order to implement the insertion operation. So it's not that long, okay? The basic step, if we go through it, okay, is that, I mean, there's basically three separate cases. If you look at it, this is in the book. Case one was the push to trouble by recoloring. Case two was just doing one rotation. Case three was doing a ro rotation and recoloring. Okay? And that was exactly the cases that we had. Any questions about these? Okay? Fair enough. The other operation we would like to do from a red-black tray is to delete things from it. Okay? The lesions from trees are harder than insertions into trees. We learned that last time when we did the regular, okay, operations, okay? But if we remember when we were doing in binary search trees, there were three kinds of cases of insertion, of deletion. One was the guy we deleted was a leaf, in which case we normally could just plunk it away if we think about it like this. In the previous case, if that was a node we wanted to delete, we could have deleted it from um, a, our binary search tray by just sort of re making that pointer nil. If we delete a node for, that was a leaf from a red-black tray, is that going to change whether it's a red-black tray? Think about this for a second. Okay? What happens if the node was red. If we delete a leaf that was red, does it change the red blackness of the tree? The answer is no. Why is that? Because if it was red, it had, well, I mean, its, it's nil pointers were black descendants. This guy had to be black. It's perfectly happy to have a black child. No problems with that. The black height of these nodes, if this guy was red, isn't going to change. Because we don't count the red height. Okay? So if this guy was Red, we're perfectly, it's good riddance. If it's black, we've got a problem, and we're going to have to deal with it. Okay? Any, any questions about that? Okay? What was the other case in, in deleting, another case in deleting this thing? One was the case where our node had only one real child to it. What did we do in this case if we had our tree A, and let's just maybe get a little closer, A, B, if we deleted this node Y, that node subtree got stuck up here. If this node was red that we deleted, is, is, is what we still have after this operation a red-black tree? Why is that? Did the black height of anything below it change? No. Could we have introduced a, a, a red parent-child combination? No, because black, this, if this node is red, this guy has to be black and black. They're perfectly happy to be related. Okay? If this guy was black, do we have any problems that we deleted? Why do we have a problem? Well, two potential problems. First of all, these guys might be both red. 
And second of all, these guys down here have lost a, red, a black ancestor. So we're going to have to take care of that problem. Okay. What was the third case? The third case was we deleted an internal node. What did we do if we had an internal node? How did we delete it from a regular binary search tree? We found its successor, its rightmost, leftmost node, relabeled it, and then deleted the guy from the leaf. Does that sound familiar? If we do this operation, what color should this node be when we move this node up here to keep everybody happy? Keep it the same color that it was before. For the tree to be red and black, we don't care what the values of the keys are. Red and blackness is purely a property of sort of where the nodes are. So he doesn't care if we change his name from B to Y. He's perfectly happy. The problem has now reduced itself to deleting somebody from the leaf. So the real trouble is, was this node red? If this node was red, we can delete it without incident. If this node was black, we've got a problem. We've got to deal with it. OK? Any questions about that? OK? Seems reasonable to understand that you look at these cases, see where the trouble is. OK? How do we fix it? Well, it gets a little bit complicated, okay? But I want us to sort of understand the basic idea. You should be clear. We've shown where the trouble is. In order to fix it, we've got to make sure we break, it, break our situation into enough cases that we can deal with it, okay? So what's the problem with deletion? The node we removed was red. Did we still have a red black tree? Yeah, reds were perfectly happy to remove. If the node we deleted was, was, was black, we have to make sure we give each of its descendants another black ancestor. OK? If the node was red, again, we, simply have, we can simply color it black. OK? Otherwise, we restructure. So what were the three cases? In three cases that would cause us trouble, we had nodes that suddenly needed black ancestors. OK, they were the three cases corresponding to the insertion or the deletion. What we're going to do is, if, the, if that node that needs a black ancestor was black, we're temporarily going to call it double black and try to get rid of it. If it was red, we're going to make it black. If it was black, we're going to make it double black. If it was red, it's going to become black. If it's black, it becomes double black. Once we've done this, our goal is going to be to restructure the tree to get rid of these double black things, which don't have any role in a red black tree. They're just a fiction to maintain for a while. And I'd just like to go through the case analysis briefly. I don't even really want to go through the code, or really even sort of the algorithm. But just to give you an idea of the complexity of what's involved, OK? We're going to make, set it up in such a way that we make sure that we've got a double black node, we want to fix it. Okay? How do we fix the double black node? Well, we're going to take, make sure, take a look at all possible cases. This double black node has either a red brother or a black brother. Question, yes? Okay. Suppose we had our, went back to our tree. Here we had a situation where we had, let's go back to this case here. Here was this node Y. If this guy was black, deleting him caused trouble, right? So why don't we take this child, which was black, and now temporarily call it black black? This node is now doubly black. All of its children are perfectly happy now because they only care how many black things they go through. If, if dad's going to count for twice as black, they're perfectly happy. Here, if we start with this guy, if this node was black, okay, we're now going to take the parent, okay, and make this guy, if he was red, okay, we'll make him black. If he was black, we'll make him double black. Okay? So in either case, if it's a double black node, that's the trouble. Okay? 
And now we then have to figure out how to erase this guy. Okay? And just to sort of show you the, 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 the cleverness involved, okay? What was the case analysis? The double black node, okay, either it's going to have a red brother or it's not going to have a red brother, okay? If it doesn't have a red brother, it means it has a black brother, okay? But a black brother is not going to be enough. We'll have to start worrying about our nephews. What is a nephew? Let's see if I can remember it, okay? If I have this node, okay, this is my parent, this is my uncle, I'm sorry if it's male generated. These are going to be my nephews. Okay, they're my uncle's children. Correct? Okay, does everybody agree with that? That's a family I know. Yeah, but shouldn't your uncle be older than you? So it's one generation higher. Oh, it's, uh, I, my nephews, excuse me. Nephews are my brother's children. Excuse me, you're right. My cousins are my uncle's children, right? That's right, that's right. Am I right about this, or? Right, so, that, so, so, so really my cousins are my brother, my, my, my nephews are my brother's children. Yeah, yeah. That's what it means. Okay, sorry to be confusing. Okay? So if I'm, what's the problem now? Where this guy's double black, okay? The nephew here, okay, if, 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 my, if my brother was red, that was okay. This guy, if this guy's black, I'm now going to worry about the, uh, Nephews, okay? What are the cases for the nephews? Either both nephews are black. If they're not ne both nephews are black, my left nephew might be red. One possibility is that this guy's red and this guy's black. Another option is that this guy is red and I don't care whether this guy is, is black or not, okay? So, these three cases together capture all possible colorings of my nephews, okay? And I'm not going to go through it, but for each of these cases, there's a sequence of rotations that does the job and fixes things up for them, okay? Any questions about that, okay? I don't want to go through the actual operations. Those are confusing. But you should be convinced where the problems are. That seems reasonable to go through it and understand it well enough to see where the problems are, okay, when you delete a guy. And then see that this case analysis does, in fact, suffice to handle everything. And then I think it's fair for you to believe that by doing a certain amount of clever rotationing and recoloring, you can fix the job up, okay? If you want to look at it in more detail, that's fine, okay? It's, again, it's tricky, but not hard, not conceptually hard, okay? Just details to keep straight. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Right, so what we're going to do is temporarily call this do node doubly black, which, which means that we're going to count it as, anytime you pass through it, it counts as two, two black nodes. And then re rotate and recolor to get rid of that. Right, you may, well, maybe we can get away by just recoloring. Depends upon what these cases are. If we've got a red brother, maybe we, I mean, it, it depends upon the details of the cases. But just like if you care, understood the insertion case carefully, you should have believed that by rediddling these things, you should be able to fix it up. Okay? Any other questions about that? Okay? Very good. The, um, What's us see now. Again, it's clever, but um, the details there get a little overwhelming, okay? But the bottom line conclusion here is that, in fact, okay, red-black trees let you implement all dictionary operations in log n time, okay? That, um, you know, the reason, because they always stay red-black trees, we're always doing in the restructuring operation a constant amount of work per level to take this node and perk it back to its right spot. So if it, it's time, all the operations are proportional to the height, and since it always is a red-black tree, the operations have to take log n time. Okay? So the neat thing is we can do insertion, deletion, max and min, predecessor and successor, all within log n time on a red-black tree. 
Okay, because all those operators take time proportional to the height of the tray, and they're always of this type. Okay? Now, there's other kind of balanced trees that also achieve this kind of performance bound. Some of you may have grown up learning about AVL trees. Okay, how many people have heard of AVL trees? Okay, mostly the Russians in here have all grown up with AVL trees because those were invented by Russians. Okay? But AVL trees, in some sense, achieve these same bounds. Okay, but they're a little trickier to deal with. And for, for te certain technical reasons, red-black trees are now preferred. Okay? What is one of the technical reasons why they're a preferred? Well, because they're American? OK, that's one reason. But that's not, that's not the only reason. Okay? The real reason, I think, is because okay, that there's something kind of tricky about it. When we did the insertion, you'll notice that we never did more than one more than two rotations on the insertion in order to fix up the trouble. Correct? We may have had to sort of turn our, the red child the right way, and then that one rotation is to do the recoloring. So it never took more than two rotations to fix it on an insertion. And likewise, it never, when you go through that case, it never takes more than three rotations to fix it on the, um, what do you call, on the, um, on, on the delete. So in fact, you never do, you do a logarithmic amount of work, potentially, propagating colors around. But you never do that many rotations. And while rotations are only constant time operations, it turns out that sometimes people build very complicated data structures where doing a rotation takes more work because you, you have a lot of other junk associated with it. And by guaranteeing that you never do too many of them, there's times when red-black trees are, you know, end up avoiding problems that might be in some of these other balanced search trees. But there's lots of different balanced search trees which achieve log n time. Okay? There's you know, um, AVL trees. There's splay trees, okay, which achieve it under a slightly different condition. There's B trees. There's lots of different trees that you can use. Okay? The basic idea for all of them is we're going to try to keep the tree roughly balanced okay, and do just the operations we need to keep that tree under our definition of roughly balanced. Any questions about that? Okay. That said, okay. Good luck on the exam. Okay, and we'll talk. We'll see that. I'll see you guys there next Tuesday. Okay. Thanks a lot.